So let's welcome Paul Stanton. Thank you, Dave. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I was introduced to Redis back in 2013. And at the time, for me, it was a uh, key value store. And it's been really so neat to see Redis grow over the past uh, seven years. Some of you asked earlier, well, you know, is Redis a full-blown native database, or is it just an add-on to SQL? Yeah, it's very clear it's absolutely both. It's a great way to refactor existing SQL, you know, monolithic databases. I was talking with uh, people here today that are embarking on that. My company helps people modernize SQL-related databases. One of the things we do is we work with people on uh, using Redis for a way to bring microservices into their mix of uh, solutions. So it's very clear uh, to me it's both. Um, we're going to talk today, though, on how Redis enhances uh, modernization of SQL. Uh, so it's all various forms of SQL. And we're also going to talk about uh, the role that Kubernetes is uh, going to play now and in the future. So I want to start with a couple of questions. One is, how many of your organizations today are running uh, Node.js and .NET Core apps on Kubernetes? On yeah, on Kubernetes. OK, not very many. How many of you have heard of plans in your organizations to move the front end apps to Kubernetes? OK, so more, but still a minority. Well. I'm never short of an opinion. I'll say that that trend is likely to grow far faster than I think uh, many of us would expect. Uh, certainly my customers are doing it. It's predominant in uh, the companies that we work with. And I'll just assert that I think that that's uh, the future. So, but what we're gonna do here is uh, We're going to uh, cover a, a few of the standard SQL use cases. And then we're going to talk about Kubernetes and Redis together and how those can be combined. So the first uh, use case, and uh, John was just presenting on this, so I'm not going to belabor it, is very, very well-known use case, and that is where you're going to offload the SQL backend with a Redis-based cache. Um, this works best for, you know, frequent reads, infrequent writes. It's data that's ac accessible by all the users. Uh, you have to include a defined, you know, eviction plan for that cache data. And it works very well, you know, for a SQL-based backend because it's going to offload these uh, reads from it. You know, and so one of the ways people benefit from Redis is they're effectively offloading the computing from that expensive, slower SQL backend to obviously, you know, an economical purpose-built, you know, Redis engine. The next use case that is very common and also widely used, widely supported, many examples and code for this is using Redis to manage uh, user session states. Now, some distinct differences here. The session states obviously are specific to a user session, so it's not shared data. This is also session state that's being managed by Redis very actively, so it's, uh, if you will, kind of taking a primary role on managing that session while it's uh, in place and then writing the uh, contents of that session to the back end when the uh, session is completed. And this is really to preserve or optimize that user experience. That's what Redis is really about for when we're working with a SQL Server back end or a SQL back end. It's really about optimizing that user experience. We're going to come back to this later as we discuss Kubernetes. and. Uh, 
Redis is going to manage this. It's going to persist the data back to the SQL backend, and this data is not shared. It's specific to that user session. It's obviously very common in a shopping cart uh, scenario. Another one that uh, is really neat, uh, Dave and I were talking about this during the break, is how Redis can be used to rate, uh, implement you know, a rate limiting uh, solution. Uh, we had a good uh, presentation on this earlier in the afternoon. And you know, here, uh, you're typically going to be used rate limiting to you know, preserve uh, a service level on that SQL backend in the midst of what could be very bursty user traffic. You can recognize the user traffic as it's coming in and manage it gracefully. Uh, Dave was sharing with me a uh, design where a company had recognized that they had occasionally you know, bursts that you know, could uh, threaten their delivery of the service. What they did is they just implemented a, a queue, a real simple queue, spacing out the uh, uh, requests, even by a quarter of a second, was all that was needed to address the short-term bursts that they faced, and that allowed them to continue to offer a high level of service, but without having to, you know, push the system to ever larger levels of compute and other resources. Um, you know, I'm not going to belabor it, but, you know, the use of counters and a time to live are key to this, uh, the fact that this is all supported with a single threaded serialized counter always amazes me, but you know, it also illustrates how Redis is really designed for optimized for certain activities, and I think you know, the SQL backends will continue to have their role as well. Although I'll say I've got friends at Amazon who have gone all the way with NoSQL and they tell me SQL's not needed. <laughs> okay, now getting back to one of my opening comments, what I see is that people are moving their front-end apps to run on the public cloud. Obviously, that's a well-established trend. And now we're increasingly seeing the, the .NET Core and the Node.js apps running on Kubernetes. This could be Kubernetes on any of the major public clouds or it could be on a, a private cloud. And it becomes obvious at that point if you're out to optimize your user experience, then you would want to run Redis alongside of those front-end apps where they are. And that's going to be on that Kubernetes cluster. Now, first challenge arises is, well, if I'm working with Redis with a SQL backend, how do I do that if the SQL backend is somewhere else? And it, today, it almost by definition is somewhere else, typically on-prem. I've spoken with several of you today where that's the case. And uh, the, the second challenge is, how to deploy and monitor and manage this environment once SQL is in the cluster. I don't know if any of you are involved, but deploying even a Redis uh, distributed cluster environment, deploying that in a geo-replicated fashion, managing it, monitoring it, running essentially a Redis cloud type operation is non-trivial today. So we're going to talk about how do you move forward in a you know, multi-site, multi-cluster environment? That's challenge number two. So we're going to talk about how a SQL proxy service can be used today to support Redis and Kubernetes with your front-end apps and to support the practical issues of DR, rollback, and support for DevOps and development and testing. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, new solutions that are coming for managing and deploying database clusters as a service, where you've got master-slave clusters being deployed across one or multiple sites, 
implementing the monitoring and operational support that those need. Now, we talked about uh, the use of a SQL proxy, and on the upper left, what I'm depicting here is an architecture where uh, databases can be served up with Docker containers, and in this illustration, we're talking about SQL Server containers, and those containers are being served up with what we call live secondaries. What a live secondary database is, is a database that's created from a log shipping image, and it supports read, write. It's a lightweight clone of that image, and it's delivered in a matter of seconds. Now, this is uh, an important aspect of how you would want to support a development lab with Redis and SQL, because what this does is it gives you the ability to serve up uh, production class databases for your development and test purposes. If, after all, you want to work on optimizing performance, then I think it's only reasonable to work with a full-blown, you know, bona fide set of production databases. A live secondary and the database clones that are served off of it can scale to support complex environments of dozens of databases and multiple terabytes. You can also apply data masking and other uh, scripts for encryption and other purposes. So this can be a fully secure environment for dev and test. But this gives you the ability to do your Redis-based development uh, with you know, uh, Kubernetes-ready environment. So it's in a container. It's got a mounted full-blown database or a set of databases. It's very straightforward then to hook up and integrate support for Git to orchestrate this via uh, Kubernetes to orchestrate the dev test pipelining with Azure DevOps or Jenkins or other CI servers. And that is your back-end, you know, Redis-related environment. Now, then you can then orchestrate that via a SQL proxy that's running in the Kubernetes cluster. And that SQL proxy, what it does is it exposes SQL as a Kubernetes service in the cluster. So from an application point of view and from a user point of view, the application has no idea that that SQL service is not local to the cluster. So if you are doing dev and test on a dev and test cluster, you can serve up you know, a dozen SQL services with its associated environment, and uh, away you go. You can do continuous integration. You can do uh, a development process that keeps pace or nearly keeps pace with the sort of speed that people are accustomed to in developing with Node.js or .NET Core. You can do it now with a full-blown, you know, terabyte, two terabytes, four terabyte database environment where you can be really doing some, you know, performance optimization with your caching strategies, your assessment management, and other things. You can implement and test your rate limiting strategy because one of the things you can do here is you can also mirror uh, user production traffic to this environment as well, you know, because this is a throwaway, you know, but at scale development environment. One of the things that we've done in the past is we've actually mirrored entire Kubernetes clusters, and it's great for blue-green testing and for, for performance measurements. If you can mirror your production traffic into a dev test environment, then you know when you deploy what it's going to do. So that's really the model here is to take the, you know, production databases, uh, make them available for a full-blown dev test process to support, you know, these modern architectures that we're dealing with and, you know, which I think that are going to become more and more common in the form of Kubernetes. Um, so I'm going to pause here for a minute. Are, are there any questions at this point about what I'm presenting? Yeah. Are you using, are you using like HAProxy or Envoy for the SQL or 
Are you using HAProxy or Envoy to connect to the SQL clusters uh, outside of Kubernetes? Yeah, uh, no. Uh, Envoy would typically be used for being a proxy front end for Redis. But here, we're actually using a TCP level proxy for the SQL traffic. We also have TDS level uh, proxy caching. That's one of the things I want to talk with Redis about. Uh, but yeah, this is a TCP proxy. It's purpose built for you know, managing the uh, SQL and exposing SQL as a uh, service here. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you were saying you're using log shipping. Um, ha have you implemented um, availability groups in any of these? Uh, we have not. Uh, right now, you know, my company is focused on, you know, the customer requests that we're getting from our, our clients. And so the DR support that we have is based on an asynchronous transaction log update. Uh, but we certainly will be looking at availability groups going forward as well. So is this SQL on Windows or are these Linux instances? Uh, this supports SQL on Windows as well as SQL on Linux. Okay. And we also support Postgres and MySQL as well. Anything else? Okay, so then the next uh, problem that we face or challenge, if you will, in working with Kubernetes and Redis and SQL backends is, you know, today deploying these clusters and managing these clusters is a complex endeavor. Uh, we had a present presenter, uh, just a uh, fellow from Sinclair Broadcasting, talked about the complexities of maintaining a uh, distributed set of uh, Redis clusters. Non-trivial. It's non-trivial to deploy. It's non-trivial to manage and uh, operate. And we hear that as well from people who are working with MySQL, with uh, Postgres, and it's a ubiquitous problem. Because we're moving to a new environment in Kubernetes. It's a, basically a new form of container-oriented infrastructure. So we're actually building a database cluster as a service solution. We've got uh, deliveries planned later this quarter. I'm looking for people that are interested. Come find me afterwards. Uh, we're going to support MySQL and Postgres in these different environments. I want to talk with Redis about their interest in having Redis uh, built in support as well. And you can imagine a server with a web browser with the ability to say, look, I want to, I want to deliver a cluster in this site with these number of uh, slave nodes. And the second site, I want the cluster configured this way. Uh, we want to deploy it. We want to monitor it. And we want to be able to manage our updates and backups, et cetera, et cetera. So if any of you are interested in, in that level of uh, support on Kubernetes, uh, track me down. My email address is on the uh, presentation as well. And we've got, you know, the beginnings of the product. It's working today. It's, we're, you know, I have a hard time keeping my developers focused on the right tasks because they're all jazzed up about, oh, we want to build Kubernetes support, which is, you know, what, part of what we're doing. Okay, so I've helped Dave to get you back closer to being on track with your time. I'm gonna, uh, basically done here, so I'm going to wrap up and ask uh, any further questions. <laughs> any further questions before we get going? Okay. Okay, I think very we're good. good. Thank you, Dave. Great. Thank you very much.